I don't know if we'll read this every Sunday morning throughout this series on the attributes of God or not, but we're two for two. Verses 23 and 24, Jeremiah 9. This is the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Father, You are the one true God, the great and and transcendent and almighty God. Lord, You are so not like us in many ways. Your greatness, Your supremacy, Your sovereignty, Your power. Yet, Father, You created us. We are Your people. We are the work of Your hands. And it is our best this morning to acknowledge You in Your greatness and to seek to know You, to know You more. So come, Lord, by Your Holy Spirit and speak to the hearts of every one of us this morning that we might in some measure know You more this morning than we did yesterday evening. That we might in some measure know an increased revelation of who You are. Lord, bless us this morning with Your presence. Speak now. Speak in the coming hour as Jeff preaches. Glorify Yourself, Your Son, Your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. this morning is the second topic of 20-something studies we'll be doing on the attributes of God, and we will look at together this morning the doctrine of God's immutability. I'm trying to group these in such a way, knowing that, that these are going to come um, in, in multiple pieces. We're not going to be teaching 20-something weeks straight, as I explained last time we met. So round one for example, is going to be three consecutive weeks. So next week will be the third study in this series. And and so I wanted to attempt to group certain attributes together that I thought would be most helpful in chunks. And so yes, uh, last week we discussed <clears throat> the aseity of God. And I broke that down into three parts. God's eternality, God's self-existence, and God's self-sufficiency. And this week we are going to dig into God's immutability. What, what does immutability mean? Unchanging. I like it, brother. Well put. As I said last week, the most important thing for any man ever born of a woman to know is the Lord God Almighty Himself. A true and saving knowledge of God is the most important thing we can know. You remember Hosea 6.3, which I quoted last week. I'll quote in part this morning. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. So the theological term that I want to unpack for us this morning is immutability. God's immutability. The word is derived from the Latin word immutabilis, which is a compound word, im, I am, meaning not, and mutabilis meaning changeable or mutable. Words like unchanging or constant or faithful help us grasp the essence of this attribute of God. This, just like God's aseity, is one of His incommunicable attributes. Meaning that this attribute is unique to God alone 
This attribute is not shared with man. We are the furthest thing from immutable. We are extremely mutable. Which would mean not unchangeable, but changeable. We're changing all the time. All creation, everything that exists outside of God, is mutable, is changing. For starters, everything that exists outside of God came into existence by the hand of God. So it has a beginning. Anything that has a beginning might have an ending. It's mutable. We, as men, women, no matter our age, from the day we are born to the day we die, are altogether mutable. We change. We grow. We live. We die. God does none of these things. Yes, God is all-powerful, but He does not grow. God knows all things, but He never gains an ounce of new wisdom. The hymn writer of immortal, invisible, God only wise in the third stanza says, We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. N-A-U-G-H-T. Nothing changeth thee. The Dutch theologian Herman Boving says, The doctrine of God's immutability is the highest significance in religion. The contrast between being and becoming marks the difference between the Creator and the creature. Every creature, including you and I, is continually becoming. It is changeable, constantly striving, seeks rest and satisfaction, and finds this rest in God, in Him alone. For only He is a pure being and not becoming. The creator-creature distinction. We can reason like this. All that is mutable, excuse me, all that is immutable is by nature God. And all that is God is by nature immutable. I'll bring this out more in the coming minutes. And to tie this back into last week's study, how does immutability connect with the existence of God? I'll put it like this. One that can suffer the slightest bit of change is neither eternal or self-existent or self-sufficient. But God is those things. And by His very nature, never suffers the least bit of change, for better or for worse. The very fact that God is eternal speaks to His immutability. He was not and now is. He is the I Am, who I am, which is the ongoing, eternal, operating outside of time, self-existent, self-sufficient one. I am convinced, and only became more convinced this week as I studied this topic, that Christians should well acquaint themselves with the doctrine of God's immutability. This particular attribute, I believe, is one that is foundational and one from which we can derive great amounts of comfort. I hope to make that as clear today as possible. So together we will consider God's immutability. Good morning, Nick and Erica. And I want to do it from three different angles. God is immutable in His being. God is immutable in His will. God is immutable in His promises. So let's dig in. Number one, God is immutable in His being. His essence, His very nature and character. Turn with me to Psalm 102. Psalm 102. And I'll read verses 25, 26, and 27, the last three verses of this great psalm. 
Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Now this tells us a lot about God, doesn't it? But there's a key phrase in verse 27, five simple words, but you are the same. And I want to focus in on that. A summary of those three verses, simply put, might be all things change. God changes things. God does not change. Three easy statements that we can pull from those three verses. John McDuff said of this phrase, You are the same. What a fountain of comfort is to be found in the immutability of God. Not one ripple can disturb the calm of His unchanging nature. Were it so, He would no longer be a perfect being. He would undeify Himself. He would cease to be God. Change is our portion here, says the psalmist. They shall perish, says the Scriptures. This is the brief chronicle regarding everything on this side of heaven. The firmament above us, the earth beneath us, the elements all around us, all these things shall be dissolved, says the Scripture. Scenes of hallowed endearment, they have fled. Friends who sweetened our pilgrimage with their presence, they are gone, but here is a sure and safe anchor amid the world's heaving ocean of change. You are the same. All is changing, but the unchanging one. The earth scaffolding may give way, but the living temple remains. The reed may bend to the blast, but the living rock spurns and outlives them all. In the teaching last week, when we considered God's eternity, we were considering His duration. No beginning, no end. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Today's study on God's immutability involves the unchangeableness of God's being throughout that duration. Immutability is the state of God's being. I, the Lord, do not change. Eternity is the duration of God's being. All right. Immutability and eternity are clearly linked together then. Some have even defined eternity as the possession of an immutable life. Think about that. God's being cannot be altered by anything outside of Himself or within Himself Again, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3.6 While all created things fulfill their God-given purpose and then fade away, like a worn-out garment, as Psalm 102 says, God knows no fading, no changing, no ending. Stephen Charnock, the English Puritan, says he lacks nothing. He loses nothing but doth uniformly exist by Himself without any new nature, new thoughts, new will, new purpose, or new place. This is the unchanging God. In ancient times, men would illustrate God's immutability with a cube. Carve a cube out of wood. A six-sided cube, equal on every side. Because no matter where you test that cube it will always maintain the same posture. Drop the cube from a hundred-story building, no matter how that cube lands, it maintains the same posture. Kick the cube down the road, throw the cube in water, however it lands, it always maintains the same posture. James in the New Testament says it this way, every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights 
with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. No variation. He is the same forever and ever in His being, in His attributes, in His character. Our God is the unchanging God. Though God's attributes individually differ from one another, meaning His wrath is not His mercy, that makes sense, doesn't it? His wisdom is not His power, that makes sense. Immutability is the glue that holds all of the attributes together because He is not changing in any of these individual attributes. Every attribute is an immutable attribute. Charnock once again. There is not one perfection, but may, may be said to be and truly is immutable. None of them will appear so glorious without this beam, this sun of immutability, which renders them highly excellent without the least shadow of imperfection. How cloudy would His blessedness be if it were changeable? How dim His wisdom if it might be obscured? How feeble His power if it were capable of being sickly or languishing? How would His mercy lose its luster if it could change into wrath? And it's His justice, much of its dread, if it could change into mercy. So you see the importance of God's immutability. He is forever the same. And He is forever the same in His love. He is forever the same in His justice. He is forever the same in His grace. God's attributes or we could also say God's perfections, make up His very being. And the being of God is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, immutable. Think of these verses. God's immutable strength. Deuteronomy 33.27 The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Not just strong arms, but everlastingly strong arms. What about God's immutable love? Jeremiah 31 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. It's an immutable love. God does not love one day and stop loving the next. God does not love one day and hate the next Tuesday. God's love is immutable. If you are the object of His love, you will forever be the object of His love. That's what we mean when we speak of an immutable love. How does your love look on that scale? What about immutable sovereignty? Psalm 145.18 Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Elsewhere in the Scriptures, He's called the everlasting King. Again and again we read of His everlasting dominion. Daniel chapter 4 is a great example. Nebuchadnezzar recognizing this wonderful truth. Everlasting sovereignty. He has always ruled. He has always had dominion. And He always will. What about immutable wrath? Isaiah 33, 14, Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire, who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Oh, we don't want to just glance and skip over this one. He's unchangeable in all of His attributes. And that includes His wrath. Why is there an eternal hell? Because His wrath is immutable. It doesn't change. It doesn't wane. What about immutable faithfulness? All of this is right from the text. Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. An immutable, unchanging, undying faithfulness. This is another of God's attributes. One that we will look at in the coming days. And sixthly, immutable light. 
1 John tells us God is light. 1 John 1, 5. Isaiah 60, verse 19. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. And your God will be your glory. Everlasting light. God is light. Unchangeably so. And in Him, brethren, is no darkness at all. He's immutable in all of His attributes. And we need this. We are dealing with something altogether scary if we do not have an immutable God. In the Bible, names, names that God gives to Himself, puts upon Himself, they're very important, aren't they? Each of the names that we could discover in the Old Testament Scriptures, they, they tell us something important about God, His nature, who He is, what He's done. So consider these names of God and how it reveals this truth that God is immutable, unchangeable. We looked at one last week, Exodus 3.14. We won't take a lot of time here. I am who I am. This is what he says there at the burning bush to Moses when he's calling him to go into Exodus. Tell them, I am has sent you. This certainly speaks to his self-existence, his eternality, as we looked at last week. But both his self-existence and his eternality speak to his unchangeableness. A changing one is not an eternal one. How can you even talk about change when you operate outside of time? Change takes place in time. God is not bound by time. These are lofty thoughts I don't even pretend to grasp. The unchanging one, the constant one, the fixed one, the immutable one. God does not announce to Moses in that day, I was. Nor does He announce to Moses in that day, I will be. He says, I am. And I will always be I am. Deuteronomy 32.4 The song of Moses. And we see that God is the rock. The rock. What is more constant or more steady or more unchanging than the rock? Well, you might say over thousands of years, Brother Lee, or over millions of years, the atheistic materialists might say, Rock might change. Well, that's, that's not the point. Yes, I guess we could take any rock and throw it from a hundred-story building and it's about to change. But we take the characteristics of the rock that God intends us to take and it's steady, it's immovable, it's unchangeable, it's constant. Thus, we have the hymn today as well as the reference Jesus Himself makes in Matthew chapter 7, On Christ the solid rock I stand. I remember, brother, your time with the children at the hotel that morning and you pulled out your electronic device and you were talking about foundations. And it is the foundation on rock that we need. That rock is God Almighty. That rock is the Lord Jesus Christ, as Philip shared with us last Sunday morning. The rock. Deuteronomy 32.4. Thirdly, the everlasting God. Genesis 21.33. I think this has a new connection tie with the statement that the writer to the Hebrews makes about Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13.8 That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You hear that? He's the same. He is the everlasting God. He neither diminishes or grows because He's perfect in all of His being. Fourthly, Jeremiah 10.10 I jumped ahead and already shared this name. He is the everlasting King. His sovereign rule, His sovereign authority remains unchanged. Though all the kings of the earth mount all the armies of the earth against Him, it matters not. He is the everlasting King. A.W. Pink wrote, Herein is solid comfort. Human nature cannot be relied upon. But God can. However unstable I may be, however fickle my friends may prove, God changes not. His purpose is fixed. His will is stable. 
His word is sure. Here then is a rock on which we may fix our feet while the mighty torrent is sweeping away everything around us. Truly, Pink is right. We want to be able to say, On Christ the solid rock I stand, for He is the unchanging God. His purposes are fixed. His will is fixed. His promises are fixed. We should be greatly comforted by this truth. Yes, we change. From last night to this morning I changed. God changes not. Bless you, sister. If the essence of God had ever changed, if it was currently changing, if it could ever change, then the solid rock that we sing about would be sinking sand. And we would be helpless in that very moment. What if God could change His eternality? What if God could change His mercy? What if God could change His righteousness, His justice, His love? We think of these things, and it's rather fearful. So when we think of the unchanging one, it should be full of comfort. Our God is not like the so-called gods of Rome or Greece. He is not fickle. He does not change who He has always been. He will always be. God is immutable in His being. Secondly, God is immutable in His will. Psalm 33, 11. The counsel or the will of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. God's plan from the first day of creation to today, it's all the same. Not one iota of His plans or His will has changed, been altered, been improved upon. His will is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Stephen Charnock again, all things else are tottering. God sees all other things in continual motion under His feet, like water passing away and no more seen, while He remains fixed and immovable. His wisdom and His power, His knowledge and His will are always the same. Malachi 3.6 I'll quote it again, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, look at the application that God Himself makes. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Yes, His will towards this people, His purposes towards this people were such that even in their rebellion, He would not consume them. This is what the prophet is saying, God through the prophet. What a treasury of comfort this is for God's people, the children of Jacob, the spiritual Israel. It is because the Lord does not change that we are not consumed today. The sin we've committed this morning alone is more than enough for a changeable God to say, I'm through with you. Thank God that He's immutable. With His own mouth, in Malachi 3, He declares it. I do not change. 1 Samuel 15.29 The prophet Samuel in this altercation with Saul where God pronounces through His prophet that I'm going to rip the kingdom away from you, King Saul. Samuel says, and also the glory of Israel, God Almighty will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Because God's wisdom is perfect, you see, His will is perfect. Because His will is perfect, it cannot change. How can you improve upon perfection? 
There has never been an instance, nor will there ever be an instance, where God learns something new or comes across a better path forward. Thus, His original decree before the foundation of the earth remains unchanged because it is best. It is perfect. It is full of wisdom and God is accomplishing all His purposes by His great power. There will never be another counselor. There will never be a more ideal solution. God's will is immutable. No knowledge can be added to perfect knowledge, can it? Can any wisdom be added to the infinite fountain of wisdom? I don't think so. Because these things are true, God's will is unchanging and unchangeable. John Gill, in his commentary, said, Men are weak and feeble and cannot perform what they purpose or promise and therefore repent. But God, the strength of Israel, is able to perform whatever He has purposed or promised and therefore repents not. Men are changeable in their minds and repent of their first thoughts and designs, but God is unchangeable and never alters His counsel, breaks His covenant, reverses His blessings, repents of His gifts, nor changes His affections to His Israel. This is good news. This is really good news. So you might be thinking, what about texts like Genesis 6 or also 1 Samuel 15 or Jonah 3 where the text says that God repents or the ESV says relents from disaster or God grieves that He had created man. How do we harmonize such texts with God's immutability? Let me read you a couple. Genesis 6.6 6, And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. 1 Samuel 15.11 I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. He regrets that he made Saul king? Is that God's boo-boo? Did, did he get it wrong? David should have been the first king of Israel after all. Now God sees it clearly. Is that how we understand those texts? Some people do. I hope we have a biblical understanding of those texts, however, and I'll do my best to explain how we harmonize such texts with the reality of God's immutability. The Scriptures do not contradict themselves. And God never changes His mind. Three answers in my effort to keep this simple and concise. Number one, here's the fancy term. My apologies. I don't know a better term for it. This is anthropopathic language. So anthropos in the Greek is man. And then pathos, we're talking about emotion. So in this compound word, this is language that attributes human emotion to God. And that's often found in the Scriptures. Just like there's anthropomorphic language which attributes human attributes or features to God. We've already read one this morning about waters flowing under God's feet. Does God have feet? No? What about God's eyes? Does God have eyes? Well, in some sense He does, but not like these two guys. So that's anthropomorphic language. Anthropopathic language is where the Scripture, inspired by God, of course, gives human emotion, attributes human emotion to God. And so we will read in the Scriptures that there is joy in God. We will read in the Scriptures that there is times that God grieves, that God relents or repents, that God is sorrowful, 
So you see, these are human emotions that are attributed to God. God does indeed feel. God is an emotional God. But it's not the same way that we feel and emote. That's all, all the other different subjects. So number one, this is anthropopathic language. Attributing human emotion, such as God was sorry he made man, or 1 Samuel 15.11, I regret I have made Saul king. It's attributing human emotion. It's condescending to us that we could understand something of the mind of God about the matter. Secondly, there is no suggestion in either of these texts, nor in Jonah 3, verse 10, and others, that God was at all surprised by man's behavior. If you read that into the text, that would be wrong. There's no suggestion that God, in his reaction to man's sinful behavior, was not long ago known, even ordained. If we're harmonizing all of Scripture, we could say that God decreed Saul would be the first king knowing that he would fail as a king and his replacement would be David. Yet God decreed that before the day one of Genesis 1. Thirdly, though God is unchanging in His being, in His will, in His promises, this does not mean that His disposition or attitude towards His creation is unchanging. God is always responding and interacting with humanity. When humanity obeys Him, when humanity walks by faith, God is pleased. God blesses such a nation. Think about 1600s America, the settlers, and God's blessing in the coming decades upon this land here. As well as God, when there is a rebellious people that are involved in all sorts of sin and idolatry, His disposition towards them changes. The hand of blessing is no longer upon them. God is judging them. God has wrath towards them. Think about 21st century America today. So do you see, God is moving, but He is immutable. Immutable does not mean immovable. God is active. This is not like the God of pantheism, a God that is detached from His creation. God is supremely involved. And thus His attitude, His relationship with His creatures changes. I would submit that these verses right here only prove that God is immutable because His attributes never change. So when God is confronted with sin, He indeed responds in holiness, in justice, and in wrath because those attributes never change. If His attributes changed, then we might not have Genesis 6-6 in our Bibles. He might not be grieved after all that men behaved in such a way. God's immutability is not equal to God's immovability. God is always acting. God is always involved. God is always working in the midst of His creation. Those are my three responses in helping us to harmonize those verses. God does not change. But He is never static or uninvolved. Rather than being contradictions, as I've said, these passages prove out this doctrine. A.W. Tozer wrote, what a peace it brings to the Christian's heart to realize that our Heavenly Father never differs from Himself. In coming to Him at any time, we need not wonder whether we shall find Him in a receptive mood. He is always receptive to misery and need, as well as to love and faith. He does not keep office hours nor set aside periods when He will see no one. Neither does He change His mind about anything today, this moment. He feels toward His creatures, towards babies, towards the sick, the fallen, the sinful, exactly as He did when He sent His only begotten Son into the world to die for mankind. Today, He feels that way. God never changes moods, nor cools off in His affections, or loses His enthusiasm. His attitudes towards sin is the same as it was when He drove out the sinful man from the eastward gate of the garden. 
And his attitude towards the sinner is the same as when he stretched forth his hands and cried, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is unchanging in his will, in his purposes, in his mind. Thirdly, God is immutable in his promises. So we've talked about his being, we've talked about his will, now we're talking about His promises. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. God is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Did you hear that? If God has spoken a thing, write it down. Be assured it comes to pass. God's decrees are permanent. His promises are fixed. All that God speaks are pure words, as Solomon declares in Proverbs 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose... He guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. That's a full two verses, isn't it? Two unchangeable things. What are the two unchangeable things he speaks of? Who's got one? Himself, his being, and his oath, his promise. Unchangeable God has unchangeable promises, they cannot be broken. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul's introductory salutation to his brother in the faith. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. These are very full statements. And we would do well to dwell on them. To be encouraged by them. There is much meat here. The God who never lies promised things before the ages began. And they were happening in Paul's day. And they're happening in our day. God is faithful to His promises. Charles Spurgeon said, it is well for us that Amidst the variableness of life, there is one whom change will not affect. One whose heart can never alter and on whose brow mutability makes no furrows. Spurgeon again says, God writes with a pen that never blots, speaks with a tongue that never slips, Acts with a hand that never fails. And my addition, loves with a heart that never grows weary. This is our unchanging God. Unchanging in His promises. Has He not said it? And will He not bring it to pass? We can be assured this morning, indeed He will. So consider, saints, brethren, all that you owe this morning to God's immutability. You have changed 1,000 times and will change 1,000 times more. He has not changed one time. Nor will He ever. Your heart, including the most mature Christian heart amongst us, is tossed to and fro in the sea of this life, confronted daily with the cares of this world, Yet God's heart remains unchanged. 
We, every one of us, will make a decision today and fail to stick with it tomorrow. But all that God has purposed comes to pass. Do you see the distinctions here? It's marvelous. As was said of Reuben in Genesis 49.4 by his own father, Reuben, you are unstable as water. So is mankind unstable as water. But the Creator of mankind is as solid and sure and steadfast like a rock. Solomon exhorts us in Proverbs 3 not to lean on our own understanding, not to lean on our humanly instability and mutability, rather lean on God's perfect wisdom, on His everlasting arms, dear Christian. God is our refuge. He is the only place of safety. Closing application. Four things I want to say. Number one, knowing God's promises are absolutely certain, we have reason to rejoice with exceeding joy. What greater news is there than an unchanging gospel? Not just gospel, which is the good news, but that it is unchanging. One that is rooted in God's immutability. One that is irrevocable. Paul says this in Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. An irrevocable gospel is the best news we could have today. An unchanging message is the best message we can proclaim today. An immutable God is the God we worship today. Knowing this, we should be joyful. Gloomy faces may surround us, but the Christian can yet have joy in a God who is immutable. That's number one. Number two, knowing God's promises cannot fail, we can be comforted with a comfort that never fades away. There's a lot of passing comforts in this world. But here is a comfort that never fades away. Because the God who has promised it never fades away. Because what He has promised never fades away. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. Here, the prophet. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. But God says, My steadfast love shall not depart from you. And My covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Everything may fall away. But what isn't going anywhere? The words of the Lord endure forever. His promises never fail. The unchanging God stands unmoved amidst all the chaotic change around Him. You see, the permanence of God's character fuels the certainty of His promises and provokes ongoing assurances and comforts in the lives of those who trust in Him. This is good news for today. So it gives us joy. It gives abiding comforts. Number three, knowing God's being is immutable, we should be greatly encouraged to pray. Think about this. Charnock says, what comfort would it be to pray to a God that, like a chameleon, changed color every moment? Who would put up a petition to an earthly prince who was so mutable as to grant a petition one day and deny it the next? But our God isn't like chameleons and princes. Though our God created chameleons, He behaves nothing like them. Though our God rules over earthly princes, He rules with immutable perfection. What better grounds do we have as believers to pray than this right here? He's the same yesterday, today and forever. David's prayers, 
that were biblical, God-exalting, Christ-loving prayers, Messiah-loving prayers, were heard just as my prayers will be heard today, just as Brian's great-grandchildren's prayers will be heard in their day. Why? Because He does not change. He does not change. The God of Asaph, in Psalm 50, who said, Call upon Me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. He's hearing prayers today with the same heart, the same power. Why? He's immutable. The Lord Jesus Christ, who some 2,000 years ago said, Ask anything in My name, I will do it. He's hearing prayers today. The same application is for us today. Let each of us then make an effort to pray with these things in mind. God is unchanging. He's unchanging in His delight of hearing His children call upon His name. He's unchanging in His power and ability to answer the prayers of said children. God is immutable. It should encourage us to pray. Fourthly, Knowing God's unchanging character, we should be warned against abiding in unbelief outside of Jesus Christ. I pray this applies to nobody here. But if it's an encouragement to the saints to pray, if it's a comfort that abides to the saints that know this unchanging One, His immutability is a terror to the wicked. Just as God's character assures the Christian of God's unending love and tender mercies that are new every morning, God's character and His immutability assures the wicked of His hostility towards all sin and sinners as well as His sure and unending wrath. Because God is immutable. His wrath is immutable. You see, God is not just immutable in the, quote, feel-good realm of love and faithfulness and grace and wisdom. He is holy, H-O-L-Y, and He is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, immutable. I'll close with this quote from a pastor in 1850. The divine immutability like the cloud which interposed between the Israelites and the Egyptian army, has a dark as well as a light side. It ensures the execution of His threatenings as well as the performance of His promises. And it destroys the hope which the guilty fondly cherish, that He will be only gentle to His frail and erring creatures, and that they will be much more lightly dealt with than the declarations of His own Word would leave us to expect. We oppose this presumptuous speculation against the solemn truth that God is unchanging in truthfulness and in purpose, in faithfulness and in justice. God does not change. All right. It's 1039. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, that's an excellent question, Mary. So this, this would have to do not with God and His immutability but with your puny or powerful prayers. Um, This has to do much more with the requests that we are making, right? The Bible, both in John 14, what I quoted, if you ask anything, does Jesus leave it there? No. He says, in my name, I will do it. Or in 1 John 5, where we have confidence because we have asked according to God's will, we can have confidence that we'll have it. So there, there is this essence that when we pray, we want to pray within God's will. 
we as humans are not able to do that perfectly, anywhere close to perfectly. Thus, prayer has to be motivated, led by the Spirit. We need to be empowered to pray in this way. Romans 8 would be a reference there. So there are times, sister, where you have prayed and it was according to the will of God and God did it and you clearly saw answers to prayer. There have been times where you've prayed and felt like you didn't get any answers. There have been times when you've prayed for one thing and God has done another thing. He's always accomplishing His will. We are not always praying according to His will. You have a follow-up question? Okay, well, I'll be glad to, to spend more time on that topic. Definitely trying to be brief. Does anybody have anything to add to that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one, yeah. Okay, thanks, Mary. Other questions? Right. Right. It is. I'll do so, and anybody can answer this question that has the courage to do it. Uh, it's not a scary question, and it's really not a trick question. What is the number one reason, according to Scripture, that we're to pray in the first place. Jake says he knows our needs, like because he knows our needs. Okay, that's not it. There it is. We're commanded to pray. So if anybody ever says, well, if God's immutable, if his decree is sure and certain, and it was before the foundation of the world, why do I need to pray in the first place? My answer is God commands us to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. It's, it's a command, it's an exhortation, it's not a suggestion. So now if we, we understand that we're commanded to pray, that it indeed is a part of the will of God that His people pray, then we can begin to see this take shape. And that, that we're not changing the will of God in any way that is fixed and certain, but as Philip said, we're joining in with it. God actually inspires His people to pray in such a way that He is going to then answer and bring about His purposes, and we are participants in the beautiful tapestry. It's rather amazing that God allows us any participation in such things at all. <laughs>